What's up, everybody? So on Tuesday, I got my blood drawn again in order to measure biological age for the fourth time uh, this year. So before we get into that data, let's just do a quick, quick recap of my three previous tests so far in 2020, and then I'll provide a good segue uh, into what my data was uh, for the other day. So my first measurement in 2020 was in February, and we can see that my phenotypic age was uh, about 14 years younger than my chronological age, around uh, 33, 32.75 years. Uh, now, it's important to note that this data uh, had a respiratory infection at that time, so I expected it to be suboptimal or not as young as it possibly could be. So I didn't really change much. Uh, I just recovered and it, uh, retested again um, in March. And we can see that just by recovering, uh, that reduced my biological age by about a year. Uh, we can see that my white blood cells, which were at 5.8 in February, came down to 4.7, which is what you would expect with a res recovery from a respiratory infection. Uh, also, my lymphocytes went back up. Uh, uh, evidently, respiratory infections reduced my percentage of lymphocytes. So by recovering, uh, I was able to go back up a little bit. But uh, n notice that I, I didn't do anything purposefully to lower my creatinine, but uh, whatever I did at that time lowered it uh, from 1.08 milligrams per deciliter to uh, 0 0.97, which is going in the right direction. Uh, higher levels of creatinine are, uh, creatinine increases with age, and higher levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, so lower is better, although I didn't do anything purposefully in the March blood test to uh, improve that. Now, uh, I suffer from grasp and pollen allergies from uh, late May to early August. So I expected worse data in June when I tested last month, and that's exactly what I got. Uh, uh, a phenotypic age of about 34 years, so still 13 years younger than my chronological age, and my worst uh, reading uh, to date uh, for, for 2020. So uh, glucose and creatinine have been going in the wrong direction for about a year and a half. So uh, uh, in order to improve on the June blood test, independent of you know the effect of my uh, allergies on my uh, biological age, uh, glucose and creatinine have been going in the wrong direction. So uh, I've been focused lately on trying to improve those so that I can uh, reduce my biological age, even if I've got allergy, uh, allergies negatively impacting my data. So first, what's impacting my glucose level? So uh, as everybody probably knows, uh, every time I blood test, uh, that blood test correlates with an average dietary period uh, because I track my dietary data every day. So if a given blood test is say three months, uh, two blood tests are three months apart, I have three months of dietary data that would correspond to the next uh, blood test. So by doing that, I can then start to look at correlations between my diet with that blood, te blood test results and with enough uh, diet blood test result data, I can investigate correlations. So this is data for the last five years. And what we can see is that my average daily fat intake is strongly correlated with my plasma, plasma glucose level. So this is the, uh, this is data, uh, 23 data points. And uh, we can see that the correlation coefficient is 0 0.72, which is technically strong, and the p-value is statistically significant. So higher fat intake, daily fat intake, higher levels of plasma glucose, or at least that's the correlation. So if I cut my fat intake, will it affect the other phenotypic age variables? So I investigated those correlations, and uh, there were non-significant correlations between my daily fat intake with RDW, alkaline phosphatase, and albumin. However, higher fat intake was also positively correlated with creatinine and white blood cell counts. So higher fat, daily fat intake, higher creatinine and white blood cells, which is going in the wrong direction. Lower levels of creatinine and white blood cells are found in youth and are associated with a lower all-cause mortality risk. Uh, however, uh, 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 actually going in the other direction, a higher daily fat intake is negatively correlated with a uh, lower lymphocyte, a percentage of lymphocytes. So that's actually going in the wrong direction because a higher level uh, of uh, lymphocyte percentage is found in youth and having more lymphocytes is, is uh, associated with lower all-cause mortality risk. And similarly, uh, a higher, my, uh, for me, a uh, higher daily fat intake is correlated with lower levels of CRP. So when considering cumulatively that um, my daily fat intake was uh, correlated with three things going in the wrong direction, but two things uh, not going in the wrong direction, I decided to cut my fat intake and see what that would do, my total fat intake and see what that would do to my uh, uh, glucose, creatinine, and all the biomarkers. So within my fat intake, it, the percentage of calories from saturated fat was significantly correlated with plasma glucose. And that's important because uh, daily fat intake can, you know, consists of monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, omega-3, omega-6. So of all the fats, uh, saturated fat was significantly correlated with plasma glucose. So a uh, higher saturated fat intake, daily saturated fat intake, higher plasma glucose, at least that's the correlation. 
So my primary sources of saturated fat are coconut butter and uh, cocoa beans. So I reduced my intake of these foods. Now I should also mention that I get about 11 grams of saturated fat from plain full fat yogurt every day, but I didn't want to cut that because of a potential effect on my red blood cell counts. And I'll get into that uh, a little bit later. So just to show uh, how much that I, uh, uh, that I cut of the uh, cocoa beans and uh, coconut butter, we can see that my average, what I've got listed here is my average dietary intake for the blood test previous to the one that I took uh, a couple days ago. And what we can see is that I cut my uh, cacao, uh, my cocoa bean intake by about half, 47%. Similarly, I cut my coconut butter intake by about half. I cut my uh, total fat intake by, which doesn't seem like much, 12 grams. And I cut my saturated fat by about eight grams, 22% cut. Now, based on cutting my uh, total uh, daily fat intake, which was around 93 grams on my last measurement, uh, when you look at the trend line for the correlation between plasma glucose with my daily fat intake, that correlates with a, uh, a 90, 93 grams a day of a daily fat intake correlates with about a 91 uh, plasma glucose level. So by cutting it, my daily fat intake to around 80 uh, grams per day, um, including the cuts from saturated fat, I expected to see plasma glucose levels you know, in the high 80s, somewhere around 88. That's assuming causation. I understand that. That's you know, why I do these uh, experiments because with enough data, but by, uh, I'll have a hypothesis and test the hypothesis. And if it doesn't work, well, the correlations will, you know, self-adjust based on how the data went. And then I'll be able to find what really does cause things to change in my body based on diet or other, vari other variables. Um, so I expect to see uh, glucose levels at around in the high 80s. And did I make any other dietary, did I make, sorry, did I make any other dietary changes? And I did. So let's take a look at that. So uh, a higher di dietary fiber intake per 100, 100 calories, otherwise known as dietary fiber density, is significantly correlated with lower plasma glu glucose. And that's what we can see here. So glucose plotted on the y-axis against fiber density, grams of fiber per 100 calories on the x-axis. And what we can see is that as the fiber density increases, the plasma glucose level, my plasma glucose level uh, decreases. And uh, it's close to a strong correlation with a correlation coefficient of 0 0.62, and it's this is a statistically significant uh, correlation. So I also saw significant correlations for vitamin C, uh, uh, potential renal acid load, PRAL, and uh, the potassium to sodium ratio with glucose. So in other words, higher levels of vitamin C were correlated with lower glucose. A more negative potential renal acid load, PRAL, was correlated with lower glucose, and a higher potassium K to NA ratio was associated with lower glucose. So when considering that broccoli uh, positively, positively affects each of these variables, I added uh, 300 grams of broccoli, around 300 grams of broccoli per day. So those who follow me uh, probably know that I eat you know, uh, large quantities of vegetables. So some might say, oh, how are you gonna add 300 if you're already eating a lot of broccoli? So uh, this is my uh, dietary intake of broccoli over the last two years. Uh, broken down by uh, average dietary period that corresponds to each blood test. And while I was eating, you know, significant, significant average daily amounts of broccoli every day, uh, up until about the last uh, eight months or so, I started to cut it down on purpose to try to see what effect that would have on my biomarkers. So as, you know, just looking at the last blood test uh, on June 23rd, uh, where I, you know, only took in an average of 19 grams of broccoli per day, uh, uh, on my, for my latest blood test, I, I averaged 295 grams of broccoli a day for the you know 30-ish uh, a day period that preceded my blood test. Now, so uh, I've increased my broccoli intake relative to the to the last blood test, and did that affect these other variables that were correlated with my glucose levels, including vitamin C, the potassium to sodium ratio, and potential renal acid load (PRAL). So uh, we can see that I increased my vitamin C intake. Uh, about 150 milligrams per day. Uh, my potassium to sodium ratio went up by one, one unit, and my uh, P-Rout uh, went more negative. So each of these changes, because they were correlated with plasma levels of glucose, I expected to uh, see uh, lower levels of glucose in addition to the changes in the fat intake. So what was the impact? Now that I've shown you all the things that I did, what was the impact on my blood test uh, the other day? Well, highly unexpected result my phenotypic age, first of all, uh, 37.65. So even though it's nine and a third years younger than my chronological age, this is my worst reading in seven tests. I didn't expect this value at all, going in completely in the wrong direction. So the impact of the dietary changes that I made on uh, creatinine and glucose 
it didn't do anything. Creatinine's still too high compared to where I'd like it to be. And my glucose level's at 99. That's the second 99 I've gotten in my past, uh, actually in 2020. And that's definitely going in the wrong direction. But also CRP 1.01 milligrams per liter. I mean, this is two and a half fold elevated compared to my nine measurements of CRP that I have since 2018. Now, one reason for that is definitely seasonal allergies. Um, you can see here I've highlighted or I've arrowed uh, dates in June and July when I blood tested. Uh, so with the exception of July 2019, we could see that my CRP at you know 0 0.67, 0 0.53, 1.01, uh, it's always significantly higher than any other time uh, with the exception of that one blood test in 2019. But even if I take that July 2019 blood test into account, my average value in Junes and July from 2018, 2019, 2020 is still about double compared to non-June and July uh, measurements. So definitely seasonal, seasonal allergies are playing a role there, but there are other factors that I'm not gonna get into uh, in this video or other factors that I think are contributing, but I won't, I'll save that for another video. Uh, also my MCV and RDW are definitely going in the wrong direction. Uh, the lower, lower levels of both MCV and RDW are associated with biological youth and lower risk of all-cause mortality risk. I have a video on that. I'll link that in the right corner. Um, so th that's the bad news. The good news is even if, when I average my four biological age measurements over 2020, cumulatively, that's 34 years, which is still 13 years younger than my chronological age, which isn't terrible. Um, but I, I want it to be as young as possible. And also in, in comparison, my average phenotypic age in 2019 was 33.44 uh, years. So um, even though 2020, uh, you know, I still have a couple more measurements to go in 2020, at worst, if I am able to maintain a 34 biological age in 2020, that means over one year, one year will have passed chronologically, uh, but I may have only aged around, you know, uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 uh, years, which that's pretty good. Um, Nonetheless, I'm, I'm determined to improve on my data, especially this blood test, uh, which again, was completely unexpected. So what will I try next to go to get it going in the right direction? I'm only gonna focus on a little bit. Uh, you know, I've already bombarded everybody with data in this uh, video. So I'll save uh, some of the other uh, data for another video. But uh, I didn't wanna cut my yogurt intake, but let's have a look at some data. So I'm still interested in reducing my glucose and creatinine levels first. So um, I didn't eat yogurt up until uh, around a year-ish ago. And um, so I didn't eat it at all. It wasn't in my diet uh, for four years. So this is data since 2015. And what we can see is that my glucose levels without yogurt listed versus with yogurt in the six measurements with it. So uh, when looking at the average value without yogurt, I'm around 87 milligrams per deciliter for glucose. But with yogurt, my glucose levels are significantly higher, around 95. So a similar trend is also going on for creatinine. Um, so, uh, and that's what I've plotted here. And all of the data that I have, blood test data that corresponds to dietary intake without yogurt, and then in the six um, blood, test, uh, blood tests that I have that I have eaten yogurt uh, during those uh, 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 dietary periods that correspond to blood test data. And what we can see here too is that uh, without yogurt, is, uh, my creatinine levels are significantly lower than when I have yogurt in my diet. And again, having lower glucose levels and having lower creatinine, at least where I am now, uh, would be uh, associated with a lower biological age and potentially lower risk of uh, all-cause mortality and all the other good stuff that goes with that. So um, why haven't I cut yogurt then? What, what's going on there? So um, for some reason, for whatever reason, uh, my red blood cells are strongly correlated with my average daily yogurt intake. So again, this is data from 2015 to 2020, and this is uh, 23 data points. So 23 blood tests that correspond to 23 dietary intake. So I've plotted red blood cells on the y-axis against yogurt intake on the x-axis. And uh, so first, this correlation in the, in the right side here, again, it's strong. Uh, it's 0 0.90. And again, a correlation of one or negative one, as close as you can get to those values, is as good as it gets. And that's why it's a highly significant correlation here that, uh, with the p-value that you can see. So first, without yogurt in my diet, you can see they're all lined up on the y-axis. Uh, so my range without it was somewhere around 4.45 to 4.8. And that's 17 measurements where I couldn't get it higher than 14.8, no matter what my best efforts were. And I tried a lot of different things over the, the four-year period to try to get it to, to go up. But then what you can see too is that once I added yogurt in these six measurements since, um, even with a yogurt intake somewhere in the uh, 240 to 250 range and then higher amounts uh, around 450. 
So, so literally about a pound of uh, plain, full-fat uh, yogurt every day. Um, my red blood cells were never less than five. Now, um, why is that important? So red blood cell counts, higher red blood cell counts are uh, found in youth and they decline during aging. And red blood cells carry oxygen. So if you have less red blood cells, you're gonna have less hemoglobin, less hemoglobin to carry oxygen. Your, your cells may be suboptimal in, in being able to get oxygen then. And in that case, you know, you're, you're gonna make energy uh, inefficiently because you don't have oxygen, which is, you know, it's more efficient um, to, to uh, go through beta oxidation. So um, red blood cells in youth, in men, uh, in the young men, it's about 4.8. And then they decline to about 3.9 for 90 year olds and older. And for women, uh, red blood cells decline from uh, about 4.3 to uh, values around also 3.9 in 90 year olds or older. So that my, you know, that I could get without yogurt values as high as 4.8 was okay. But for me, I want to have red blood cells higher than five. I've had red blood cell counts higher than five in the past from, you know, about 15 years ago. Um, my, my my data for red blood cells. So I wanted to get them back to where they where they should be. So um, what am I going to do? So if I cut my yogurt intake from about 440 uh, grams per day to 300, by extrapolating based on the trend, li trend line, I should be able to, if this uh, correlation is causal, we don't know that, but uh, if I cut it to 300 grams a day by extrapolating on the trend line, I should be able to get a red blood cell count around five, uh, thereby enabling me to keep my red blood cells as close to biological youth as possible. And if yogurt actually is involved in some cause, it's whatever it may be, if it's a saturated fat in yogurt that is indeed causing higher levels of glucose and creatinine for me, um, by reducing it by my intake by about a third, uh, that may also reduce my, um, my glucose and creatinine levels, which is what I want. So lower glucose and creatinine while keeping my red blood cell counts high. So again, what about CRP, MCV, and RDW, everything that went in the wrong direction on my last blood test? Again, I bombarded you guys enough with data for today. That'll be uh, another video. And that's all I've got. Uh, you can find me lots of places online. Have a great day.